Hello everyone, welcome to the special CUBE conversation. We're here in Palo Alto, California, the CUBE headquarters and studio. Got exciting next guest, Chuck Davis, who's the CTO of Element Data, uh, doing a decision cloud. But really the story is about the role of data in decision making, biases, cognition, all the stuff that we love around big data. Welcome to the CUBE conversation. Thank you for having me, John. So we were talking before we came on camera about you know, stories around how decision making is always grounded in data, and always just analog data, not a lot of digital data. With the emphasis on cloud now, we're seeing data at the center of the value proposition. In fact, you, a recent event at AWS, Amazon Web Services, IBM Think, a couple weeks earlier, you got blockchain, AI, and data in the middle for IBM and Amazon. It's cloud scale and machine learning. Obviously, this is a big part of the culture we're seeing in society globally, not just in North America and the US, but around the world. So people are trying to get their handle on, on all this stuff. So let's, let's have that conversation. Absolutely. Your thoughts on data science, where it is today, how far has it come over the past 20 years? I think it's come tremendously far. Um, there, are, there, are, there are certain things obviously that have, that have happened, these, these, these uh, inflection points in the industry uh, that, have, that have taken place, uh, a big, one of the big inflection points obviously was you know, the reduction of cost of, of, of storage, which then led to the advent of big data. And so now you could collect more stuff and it was cheaper to store it. Um, it's, it was, it, obviously you can uh, transmit it uh, much, much easier. But now I think we're starting to really look at the origins of data itself and, and the implications of that. And I think that that uh, is really where we're going to spend the next decade or so, is really understanding um, the, the things that actually make up the data. I mean, we generate the data ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we've spent a lot of time uh, in computer science trying to figure out ways of isolating signal and noise. Mm -hmm. And the things that make us uniquely human mm -hmm. tend to be characterized as noise. And I think we're starting to finally come around and realize, especially yeah. with the advent of AI and ML, um, that that's not necessarily noise, that it might be the most important signal. You know, uh, when I started SiliconANGLE in the Cube uh, nine years ago, one of the, the slogan really was extracting the signal from the noise. And, but our, our tagline was where computer science intersects social science. And, and that really wasn't that original. And Steve Jobs had the technology liberal arts kind of uh, you know, signs with, with Apple and his, when he was turning around Apple, that was the big uh, comeback there. But this really was, we're seeing it now, we're seeing a lot of infrastructure shifts happening, whether you look at blockchain and, and cryptocurrency, a change in the nature of money and decentralization, whether you're seeing things on social media, data now is really going to be uh, the key equation. So you guys are doing something at, in your company, you've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, take a minute to explain what you're working on, and, and you've been doing this for 20 years, but talk about the, the project you're, you're executing now. Sure, so Element Data is concerned with uh, creating a, um, at scale, uh, essentially a decision cloud. And so what does that really mean? Well, uh, what, it, what it means is that if you were to, we're, we're, we're really focused on the psychology of data. So not just data for data's sake, but the psychology of data. Um, what does that mean? It means the way that data is perceived uh, and the way that human beings actually make decisions. And that tends to be based on a series of trade-offs. It, uh, it, it, it's based on uh, our cognitive experiences. It's the reason why I could present you with something, you can present me with something, and if we were to, if we were to look at it from a, a strictly logical standpoint in terms of science, we should come to the same conclusion, but oftentimes we don't. Uh, and, and so since we give rise to data, how do we maintain the integrity of that signal, that uh, emotional intelligence that's contained within the data? Um, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to do. Talk about the role of bias, because to me, you know, I like to study the social uh, science aspect of technology impact, whether it's new venture creation, entrepreneurship, or just you know, a, a better society uh, impact. And everything seems to be mission driven these days, so it's very relevant. But as you get these, and certainly the U.S. elections have recently polarized everybody, the role of bias is actually an interesting concept. I want to get your thoughts on how bias uh, is changing people's either subjective or objective views of things, and, and what is bias good or is it bad, and how should we handle 
biases because everything's now contextual and there's not a lot of context. <laughs> you go to Facebook any day these days, you see, you see all kinds of weirdness going on, but as people are connected and are sharing the same data and looking at the same signal, there's going to be biases built into everything. So what's your, what's your take on bias and, and, and from a data science and data discovery and, and cognition? Well, I'm, I'm biased against bias. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You can't escape bias. A bias is part of the human condition. Um, cognitive bias is the neurological shortcut that we take uh, to arrive at decisions or conclusions. And so, um, as, as, as a result, um, you, you want to be able to classify that and understand it, but you really can't, you can't get around it. Um, and, and so if, if you have some form of classification, which is one of the things that we're working on, how do you start to classify these different biases? Then you can actually start to recognize them. If you can start to recognize them in data, um, then you can start to figure out ways to uh, change perception uh, or at least to uh, surface that these biases are present. So we all engage in them. It's just a matter of how do you effectively um, make people aware that these biases are, are, are present and are present in their, in their data sets. And in order to do that, you need a classification system. So the decision cloud concept that you guys are going down, I love that idea. Um, and you take a graph approach, it's like a social graph kind of concept, decision graphing, if you will, is about collecting like a thousand point, million points of light, if you will, data points mm -hmm. that you're collecting together to help people make better decision making. Is that right, to get that right? Or how would you describe that, that decision cloud or decision graph? Concept. Right, so the, the, the graph is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, there, there's a fair amount of complexity, of course, hidden, hidden in it, but um, nonetheless, essentially what you have is, typically for human beings, we are, or anyone, we're, we're really are focused on making a decision. The decision is usually options, uh, a certain amount of criteria, and then also weights or importance that we ascribe to those. And so the decision cloud is about capturing those options, the criteria, uh, and also those weights, and that's the central that's the central node around an individual and or their role within an organization. Uh, as a result of that, that's a it's a big deal because if you can understand how people have formed their decisions, um, then you can start to walk that graph, and you can figure out how people or an organization got to where they are. It's the why. Um, you know, the, the, the web and technology has been focused on who, what, when, and where, um, but we still have a very difficult time answering the why, and the, and the reason why we have trouble with yeah. the why uh, is we really didn't have an ontology uh, or a taxonomy for human decision making, mm -hmm. um, and, and that has um, huge implications for the AI and the ML space. It's the reason why if you or to um, look at any one of the digital assistants and ask a question uh, and ask for help, uh, specifically help me make a decision. There's not a corpus of decision data that those agents can rely on uh, to, to help to surface a decision. Personalized medicine is something I see a lot now. and It's a big, big trend towards personalized medicine where the users can be more proactive, mm -hmm. less responding to say conditions. But you're seeing personalization is not a new concept on, on digital. Yeah, whether it's personalized recommendation engines and or other personalization techniques. But we see that changing now, with certainly as users become in more control of their data. Right. Um, is that where you can bring, you guys can bring that, that new kind of personality behind the data? Because bias will drive my selection criteria of making a decision or might hinder it. So these are, these are this is new ground in, in data science. How, do, how does the role of the person get involved in the decision making? How do you guys handle that dynamic? Because your views might be different than mine. You make different decisions based on different criteria than maybe me. Right. So yeah, it's different for per person. So you have almost an individualized aspect of it. How do you guys handle that in software? Right, well, I mean, what you're really talking about is um, allowing for human expression subjectivity to be part of that algorithmic mix. And so that's typically missing. So a good example would be in, in a medical context, um, using a decision tool to make a treatment choice, um, maybe around a particular drug regimen, uh, a surgery, a surgical option, uh, or perhaps uh, you know, a hospice option. And it really, for me, it might come down to quality of life. 
but quality of life is a subjective measure. And so as a result, it might not even be part of the recommendation engine. So our technology allows for um, that type of subjective input to be present mm -hmm. and for you to be able to place uh, a level or, or, or of importance to it. And in our world, we actually we refer to that as irrationality as opposed to the rational uh, measures. Um, but irrationality is not bad. It, it's, 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 it's human. It's, it's, a, it's a signal, it's not noise. How do you know what signal is? And as you look at, I mean, looking at all kinds of data, there's a lot of factors, timing, things change over time, context changes. Mm -hmm. How do you guys look at that? Because this is super important, something that might be relevant today, irrelevant tomorrow, un not understood today, understood tomorrow. So there's timings and context around a lot of things that could be surfaced. Is that part of? how you guys work with the decision cloud? It really is. I mean, there's that, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because that, that, that temporal nature, that dimensionality of time, that's one of the things that human beings aren't good at, that computers happen to be very good at. And so from a um, machine learning perspective, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, being able to train for that temporal sensitivity, that's how we address that. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance and leverage the strengths of machine learning along with the um, intrinsic understanding of psychology and coming up with a um, effective ontology uh, that is represented within a decision set and merge the two together. Talk about computer science and social science coming together, our, our main tagline, because this is really, you're seeing a lot of societal impact, certainly the Jobs Act um, in Washington, certainly enabled nonprofits to actually invest in mission-driven ventures, you're seeing a spawn of entrepreneurship go on around you know, uh, projects that never got funded before. So you're seeing a lot of, a lot of people doing some, some amazing things. So how, how does data on a global scale, I mean, how, different cultures come into play. I mean, you need a lot of computing power. What's the computer science intersection as computer science changes the world? It used to be you know, tech geeks would talk speeds and feeds, and now you have a human element where it's emotional. You know, I want the app to, to provide value for me. I don't really care about the speeds and feeds of a product. Right. So you know, certainly that is colliding. What's, what's your view of that intersection of this computer science and social science? Well, I think I think that it's going to become more and more prevalent as the as the tools get better, right? We're we're getting a, a better understanding. Like NLP, I can remember ten years ago, uh, you know, where it was largely bag of words, right? And so, and well, for some people, it probably still is bag of words, but it's gotten so much better, uh, and and so there's so much more that you can that you can do. But a lot of it is still slicing down into you know basically metadata. And moving beyond that, I, I think that um, as we start to look at that intersection of psychology and, so, and sociology, that becomes really, really important in terms of um, how the disciplines come together, because they didn't. I mean, in computer science, right? I yeah. mean, the computer scientists never talked to the linguist, yeah. all right? And now, if, if, you, if you're credible in this space, um, at least on the AI side, you, you're, you're working with linguists, right? You're understanding uh, origin. And I think that the same is now coming true of, of, of psychology, right? And in terms, of, um, in terms of, of, of AI, when we look at it from a, from a psychology standpoint, we're looking at it from the standpoint of needs, right? Human needs, uh, which is kind of the function of, 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 of psychology, as opposed to when we're looking at decision theory, right? That's basically understanding how the decision is made. The game theory aspect of it is how those decisions affect other people and the impact that they'll have in the interaction, their reaction to it. So it's really the intersection, I think, of those specific disciplines that are going to be the most exciting um, you know, area of, of, of technology going forward. And they're not mutually exclusive either. There's an interplay between you know, those decision theory, gamification, and human interaction. The, I, 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 I mean, the successful companies of the, of, of, of the future and of today understand that and are, are fully incorporating that and, and are attempting to embrace it. I, I think that this is exciting because it's, it's kind of like the new frontier. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and anyone that tells you that they understand the human mind, you know, 
boot them off the show. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know that that it's complex. Yeah, it's it, it, it's it's incredibly complex. We don't profess to, but what we can do is we could come up with a taxonomy and an ontology for some form of classification to begin that journey, yeah. and that's what we've done at uh, Element Data. Talk about the wisdom of crowds and how that weaves into. I know there's you know, some personal stories that you had around. Uh, your wife at medical school, that's doc well documented. I think you guys have, are, are talking about that, but people tend to care what other people think. Certainly I notice that on social media and people try to think what, understand, try to think that they know what I'm thinking, maybe not. So right. there's a lot of that going on around group dynamics and around um, collective intelligence, wisdom of the crowds is a big part of the gamification which does affect decisions and then ultimately how people feel. Right. And everyone likes to be part of a group sure. and be accepted, but also there's more data now coming out of this new dynamic. Yeah. How is that data being weaved into decision making? Uh, John's probably a whole whole show in and of itself, <laughs> but um, but when you when you talk about the with the wisdom of, of, of the crowd, there are a couple things to, to, to keep in mind. Um, first, if you, look at, at, at the, the germination, if you will, of a particular concept. I mean, people will tend to coalesce around it, and it tends to be around the topic, people's familiarity with it, and a certain perception that they have. Um, and if you're far outside of that perception, that's where you start to, to, to actually generate this excitement, or I should say this level of engagement. So for instance, if you were to say something controversial, not necessarily expected, um, you're going to generate, um, you know, more interest. I see it. All, I mean, kids do it all the time on social media, right? They do something um, dramatic. They say something. They know it's stupid, uh, but they are able to generate a fair amount of of, of interest, mm -hmm. and hence they have a, a crowd that uh, yeah. that follows them. In that case, it's a, it's kind of the, the school of fish uh, type of uh, type of, uh, of, of of crowd theory. Um, I, I think that uh, you know fundamentally. What you'll see, though, is this rise of, of, of data kind of moving in a different, a different direction. I think that if you are able to expose um, the biases that people have, um, then they are, if they're aware of them, mm -hmm. then they, they, they act differently. We talk about civil discourse a lot, certainly we did during the election process around how can we have civil discourse among, amongst ourselves to have a good conversation, to surface data, because you know, there wasn't a lot of that going on. But when you get on digital, this notion of you know weaponizing content and, and creating memes you know we had an, um, we 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 talked on the cube we've said this before control the meme you control the narrative control the narrative you control the conversation control the conversation you control the belief system and then you own the population it's kind of like that's the, the kind of the hacker formula mind hacking right it's been called right. uh, this is actually a new data opportunity to get that out it's been arbitraged through the naivety of the newness of the web or the new social graphs. So we see some people certainly hacking that. Sure. How do you turn that into a positive data source? Because if what you're saying about biases, that should be surfaced quickly. So people kind of know what the collective group is thinking. How do, how do we turn that mind hacking gamification into a positive data set? Right. I mean. I mean, it's it's interesting because people refer to it as weaponization, and and you know, I refer to it as psyops, right? Uh, I mean, it's 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 something that has has been done before in a different context, and now we're starting to see it in the in in the data context, and the, and the results are, are 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 chilling because this isn't a leaflet dropping from the sky that you that you read. It's it's really about understanding who you are at an attribute level, um, and understanding who you are from a perception level, and really dealing with the psychology, either to uh, incite you or to suppress you. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's deeply concerning, but I also think that uh, there are really good opportunities uh, for us to do things uh, that are very positive. Um, one of which, for instance, uh, you know, that, that, that immediately comes to mind is the ability to um, uh, allow people to understand their decision process. To, uh, to I mean, if, if you have a decision cloud, you can actually look at and see um, your journey, your path along, uh, along a decision path. Um, and that's not something that's readily available uh, in a in Yeah, the role fashion. of community too, we've, we've been observing and we're digging into, I'm sure you have at, at some level too, the role of communities. You look at open source software, it's been a great example of successful 
uh, consensus within communities and as a way to balance potential over amplification or overreaction or biases that could be checked or balanced together as an interesting new approach. Um, do you guys see any of that in the decision cloud where this new data source is coming in around communities and ecosystems? Well, I think that, I mean, what's interesting about communities is they tend to be self-forming, right? I mean, you can try to force people together, but they tend to be self-forming. So if, if people share a particular concept or belief, then there's a certain amount of attraction. I think that the, um, what, what's interesting is the ability to try to measure that, right? Uh, and to try to figure out um, how you can then expand that community with different beliefs and, 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 and different viewpoints so that you get something that uh, is not so homogenous but is, is more representative. And so that's something um, that we hope I mean, we can't, we can't necessarily uh, predict it, but we hope that that's something that Decision Cloud would be able to influence. Well, Chuck, it's been great to have you on theCUBE. I want to definitely follow up on some of those uh, deeper conversations. But I got to ask you a personal question. You've sure. been, uh, how long have you been at this? Uh, how did you get here? I mean, you've been scratching this itch for how many years? I mean, how did you get to this point? Because has it been a lot of research you've been doing? Is it other ventures? Tell your story. What's, uh, what's motivating you to get to this point? Yeah, basically the better part of 25 years, I mean, my background is both in computer science and um, behavioral biometrics. So I've always been interested in behavior and classification of behavior and trying to figure out, you know, from, a, from the standpoint or the discipline of computer science, how do you effectively really integrate the two? And one of the, one of the biggest riddles, if you will, which will be actually the code name of our product internally is conundrum, is how do you solve the conundrum of, of, of decision making? And we haven't solved it. Uh, I think we have a, a, a you know, pretty good understanding uh, of it, um, but by the same token, um, that seems to be the, the last big frontier, the last big yeah. open space, and that was something that I've pretty much worked my entire career, I think, to get to this point <laughs> of being able to have a phenomenal team yeah. uh, to be able to solve this problem. Yeah. Well, we'll check out Element Data, great stuff. It's a systems problem now, you said it's not one thing. Right. A lot of interplay and a lot of dependencies and a lot of interaction, a lot of data. A lot of data. A lot of data. Thanks so much for coming on and spending the time. Chuck Davis is the CT of Element Data. Check him out. I'm John Furrier here in Palo Alto for a CUBE Conversation. Thanks for watching.